<clears throat> so good morning. Good morning, good morning. We'll just wait for one or two more minutes <clears throat> till others join. Okay. So good morning to all of you and welcome back to the MCQs and image based revision part three today. Okay, again some MCQs have put in some image based questions, just try to identify them. Okay, it will be a good revision for you. We start. Good morning, good morning to all of you. Okay, I'll start. Have a look. I'm Dr. Pradeep Pawar here, Professor of Anatomy. I've been teaching anatomy since last 21 years, mentoring students for the postgraduate entrances. Okay, see the first MCQ. <coughs> MCQ that you wanted. Shall I answer this? Come on, come on, come on, come on, my dear children, answer this. An embryology based MCQ. Okay, look, I'll start. A newborn. <clears throat> have a look and decide this. Yeah. A newborn is delivered at term to a 19 years old primary gravida woman with spontaneous vaginal delivery. Okay. The mother had no prenatal care. On examination, the child had a small retracted jaw and hypoplasia of the zygomatic arch. Small retracted jaw. Tell me this mandible, mandible uh, is derived from which pharyngeal arch? The mandible, the maxilla bone, the mandible are derived from which pharyngeal arch? Yes, anyone? <coughs> which pharyngeal arch? Come on, come on, come on, answer, be interactive. The maxilla, the mandible, these are derived from the first pharyngeal arch. First pharyngeal arch, remember, like, um, uh, I'll, I'll draw that slide for you. The patient's condition is most likely caused by abnormal development of structures that give rise to which of the following? Which of the following? So that's first pharyngeal arch abnormality. The maxilla, the mandible, these are derivatives of the first pharyngeal arch. Okay, so which other structure out of this four is derived from the first pharyngeal arch? That's the MCQ. Yes, which is the other structure derived from the first pharyngeal arch? Come on, answer. Incus, yes, very good. So, answer is incus for this. Incus, malleus and incus, these two bones are derived from the first arch. The stepes is derived from the second pharyngeal arch. Second pharyngeal arch. Okay, um, what are the derivatives of the first pharyngeal arch? If you can tell me the derivatives of first pharyngeal arch, one are the four muscles of mastication. Who's that? The masseter, the temporalis, the medial, and the lateral pterygoids. These are the four muscles derived from the first pharyngeal arch. Which are the bones derived from the first pharyngeal arch? The maxilla, the mandible, the malleus, the incus. Hmm? Malleus and incus. These are the bones derived from the first pharyngeal arch. Clear. Which are the uh, what is derived from the second pharyngeal arch? The muscles of facial expressions. The muscles of facial expressions. Then the posterior belly of digastric. The stylohyoid. Posterior belly of digastric stylohyoid. Stepedius. This is derived from the second pharyngeal arch. The muscles of facial expression. Posterior belly of digastric stylohyoid. Stepedius. This is derived from the second pharyngeal arch. The styloid process. The stylohyoid, the stylomandibular ligaments, these are derived from the second pharyngeal arch. Okay. Clear. From the third pharyngeal arch, what do you get from the third pharyngeal? In the second pharyngeal arch, uh, what else is derived? Anyone? <coughs> Anyone? 
the lesser cornu and the upper part of the hyoid bone is derived from the second arch. The greater cornu and the lower part of the hyoid bone is derived from the third arch. The lower part of the hyoid and the greater cornu that's derived from the third arch. And which is the muscle derived from the third arch? The muscle of the third arch is stylopharyngeus muscle. Stylopharyngeus muscle, the nerve of the third pharyngeal arch is the glossopharyngeal nerve. Glossopharyngeal. Hmm. The fourth and the sixth arch uh, forms the cartilages of the larynx and the pharynx. Fourth and sixth arches, cartilages of larynx and pharynx. Cricothyroid muscle is derived from the fourth arch. Cricothyroid, derived from fourth pharyngeal arch. Okay. The facial nerve is a derivative of the second pharyngeal arch. Second. Okay. I'll just make this slide for you. Have a look. Right. Tell me when the embryo is folded uh, in a folded embryo, what is the first thing on the ventral aspect? That's the septum transversum. Septum transversum. Uh, when the embryo is folded, the first thing on the ventral aspect is septum transversum. Then is the developing heart. Then the developing heart. Then is the prochordal plate. Prochordal plate or the buccopharyngeal membrane which forms the future mouth. And then you have this notochord. Above the notochord, what is the structure that you have? That's the neural tube. Neural tube above the notochord. That's the primitive streak. That's the primitive knot and the blastopore. And this is the cloacal membrane. Cloacal membrane. What is this cavity going to be? The amniotic cavity. And what is this cavity going to be? I just changed the color for you. What is this cavity going to be? The yolk sac. And the yolk sac gets incorporated inside the embryo the yolk sac gets incorporated inside the embryo that's a small pouch of the yolk sac and this is what we call as the allantois or the uracus allantois or the uracus and that's the umbilical cord umbilical cord that i've drawn so these are the structures in a developing embryo when the embryo is folded the first thing on the ventral aspect is the septum transversum and this septum transversum is going to form the future diaphragm okay this forms the future diaphragm that's the heart which is forming here on the ventral aspect at this area is known as the cardiogenic area cardiogenic area the next thing is the prochordal plate prochordal plate also known as the buccopharyngeal membrane this is going to form the future mouth mouth of the embryo that's the notochord above the notochord is the neural tube and the neural tube gives rise to the brain and the spinal cord this is the primitive streak here and this primitive streak gives rise to all the three germ layers along with the epiplast. This I've told you. And that's the cloacal membrane which later ruptures and forms the anal canal. That's the amniotic cavity here and this is the yolk sac. And the yolk sac gets incorporated inside the embryo. Good morning, good morning to all of you. And this entire yolk sac is going to form what? The GIT. GIT. That means the GIT is derived from what? Yolk sac. What is the lining of yolk sac? That's endoderm. Endoderm. And this is how we say the entire GIT is endodermal in origin. It is endodermal in origin. Now we divide this GIT into three parts. What is this in front foregut? What is this in between? That's the midgut. And what's this behind hindgut? So foregut, midgut, and hindgut, right? So that's how the GIT is. So now this is the mouth here. That's the prochordal plate. And the prochordal plate lies between what and what? It lies between the developing brain, the neural tube above, and the developing heart below, right? So the prochordal plate lies between the developing brain or the neural tube and the developing heart. There's no neck here. There's no neck. And now we get a series of arches here. And these arches are known as the pharyngeal arches. Pharyngeal arches, right? So each pharyngeal arch has got four components. Four components. One, it has got a nerve of its own. There's a nerve of the pharyngeal arch. Second, there's a cartilaginous component of the arch. Cartilaginous component which forms the cartilages and the bones of that arch. There's a muscular component which forms the muscles of the arch. And last, there's an artery of the arch. Artery. Hmm? So these are the four things. One <clears throat> is a nerve. Second is the artery. Third is a muscular component which forms the muscles of the arch. And the fourth is the cartilaginous component which forms the cartilages and the bones of the arch. So we get this pharyngeal arches here. Once again, the first pharyngeal arch. The first pharyngeal arch appears here. And the first pharyngeal arch divides into two processes. Two maxillary and two 
mandibular processes. That means the maxillary and the mandibular processes are der derivatives of the first pharyngeal arch. And if there's a hypoplasia of the mandible, that means this is a defect in the first pharyngeal arch. Understanding this clear to all of you? Which are the muscles? I didn't tell you all the muscles uh, initially. The muscles are four muscles of mastication. Who's that? The temporalis, the masseter, the medial and the lateral pterygoids. What else? Two more muscles. One is the digastric here, digastric, and the uh, this is the mylohyoid and the anterior belly of digastric. Mylohyoid and the anterior belly of digastric. Is this clear to all of you? Okay. So this is the derivative of the first pharyngeal arch. See the MCQ here. Sorry. See the MCQ. So answer is incus. The incus is also derived from the first pharyngeal arch. Fine. Okay. Ha, huh. tensor palatine and tensor tympani. Very good. Very good. The tensor palatine and tensor tympani are also derived from the first pharyngeal arch. Right, right. The tensor palatine and tensor tympani are derived from the first pharyngeal arch and they are supplied by the trunk of the mandibular nerve. Trunk of the mandibular nerve through through the nerve to medial pterygoid. Very good. Fine. See the next MCQ. Identify this histological slide. Okay, fine, fine. Mnemonics you're remembering, okay. Fine, identify this slide, come on. Jejunum, okay. Anything else? Anything else? Large intestine, jejunum. Fine, 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 anything else? So first of all, this is a slide of GIT, right? This is a slide of GIT. Uh, I, I put one one histology slide every day for you so that you get an idea, complete idea. So this is a slide of GIT because it is showing four layers. One is the mucosa, mucosa. This is the mucosa. Second is the submucosa. Third is the muscularis externa. And the fourth one is the serosa. Okay. So mucosa, submucosa, the muscularis externa and serosa. Mucosa is made up of four, uh, three layers, three parts. One is the lining epithelium. Second is the lamina propria. And the third one is the muscularis mucosa lining epithelium lamina propria muscular mucosa fine now what is this empty 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 spaces that you're looking at what are these empty 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 spaces that you're looking at these are the goblet cells and see you get large 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 number of goblet cells plenty and plenty and plenty of goblet cells you see and this plenty of goblet cells are characteristic of yes what is that the large intestine or the colon so you get large number of goblet cells and the goblet cells secrete what mucus mucus and this mucus is dissolved during staining and the mucus is gone dissolved during staining and that's how the goblet cells looks empty yeah they go they're looking empty because the mucus is dissolved during staining and you need a lot of goblet cells in the colon to give lubrication for the passage of feces okay so this is a slide of colon large intestine and suppose in the slide of colon, I find lymphoid follicles like this in the submucosa. Okay, I find lymphoid follicles in the submucosa. What do you see? What do you see is this then? In the slide of colon, huh, large intestine, I find lymphoid follicles in the submucosa. Then what is that? What is that? Pears patches nahi bache. Pears patches is seen in ileum. Ileum. So ileum hoga na so. No, no, ileum hoga ta, I'll get such villus, villus, finger-like projections I'll be getting. That will be the villus. And then I'll be getting pear, uh, pears patches, lymphoid follicles in the submucosa. Then I identify this as villus. I'm not telling that. The, a slide of colon, a slide of colon, large intestine, uh, with large number of goblet cells. Fine, it's a slide of colon. In this slide of colon, I find lymphoid follicles here. Then who's that? Who's that? Bolo na think no think you must be knowing this think 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 you are not thinking. So the slide of large intestine with plenty of lymphoid follicles and the submucosa. What do you say? That's the appendix, my child. Appendix, appendix. M A L T is fine, but that is appendix. 
appendix ho gaya appendix you understand so large intestine you identify because of plenty of complex cells and with the complex cells with the slide of colon you find lymphoid follicles in the submucosa this would be the slide of appendix appendix i don't have that slide i'll put that slide sometime later for you okay so that's how you identify the the slide okay fine see the next mcq answer this answer this yes yes the rest of you answer the rest of you also answer median nerve kaise bache median nerve kaise aayega Hmm? Okay, fine. So, answer is Allar artery for this. Allar artery. Just read the MCQ. A 30 years old IT professional developed tingling and numbness in the left hand since 15 days. Hmm. Since 15 days, he gave a history of using computers for hours together in this lockdown. Hours together in this lockdown. So, uh, what is that? So, if you sit at the edge of the table, huh, the wrist at the edge of the table, there's a compression of the medial nerve here. That's carpal tunnel syndrome, a very common uh, condition seen in this lockdown period because of excessive use of computers. On examination, there's atrophy of the thenar eminence and loss of sensations on the palmar aspect of three and a half fingers. So, who's involved? The medial nerve is involved, right? The medial nerve is involved. Physician diagnosed it as a compression of uh, a structure passing deep to the flexor retinaculum. So that is medial nerve. All the falling structures pass deep to the flexor retinaculum except <laughs> understood. So <clears throat> after reading everything, you come to the conclusion the MCQ would be based on the medial nerve. But the MCQ is put somewhere uh, uh, on a different topic altogether. All the falling structures pass deep to the flexor retinaculum except your answer is going to be Alnar artery, the best answer would be Alnar artery here. Alnar artery. Look, I'll just make a slide for you. I'll just make a slide for you. Look, these are the carpal bones. These are the carpal bones here. And if this is medial and this is lateral, what is covering the carpal bones here? That's the flexor retinaculum. The flexor retinaculum. And this flexor retinaculum splits on the lateral side. On the lateral side, this flexor retinaculum is going to divide here. Divide. Now, between the flexor retinaculum and the carpal bones here, we get a tunnel here. Tunnel. And this is what we call as the carpal tunnel. Carpal tunnel. So what are the structures which are passing through the carpal tunnel? And what are the structures which are going above the flexor retinaculum? That means they are going outside the carpal tunnel. Okay. Quickly you answer this now. What is this? Uh, what is this tendon of which is passing on the lateral side? What is this tendon of? If anyone can guess this, it's on the lateral side. So this, no, this, this tendon, the corner, it's on the lateral side. It will go to the thumb. It's a long muscle causing flexion of the thumb. Who's that? The flexor pollicis longus. And these are the four tendons of flexor digitorum superficialis. And these are the four tendons of flexor digitorum profundus, right? They pass through the carpal tunnel. Now, when we move the wrist, when we move the wrist, there's going to be a friction, friction, you know, friction. So to prevent this friction, to prevent this friction, the four tendons of superficialis and the four tendons of profundus are put in a synovial sheath. There's a bag which is filled with synovial fluid, which covers this tendon of flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus. What do you call this as? What is this structure known as? Alnar bursa. Alnar bursa. So, what does the Alnar bursa enclose? It encloses the tendons of flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus. Okay. Alnar bursa with flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor digitorum profundus. This is how I write it. And there's a bursa which encloses the tendon of flexor pollicis longus. What's that? Radial bursa. That's a radial bursa with flexor pollicis longus tendon. Take an radial bursa with the flexor pollicis longus tendon. 
right now between the ulnar bursa and the flexor retinaculum there's something there's a nerve here what is this nerve which passes between the flexor retinaculum and the ulnar bursa what is that nerve that's the median nerve median nerve and now when there's an ulnar bursitis when the ulnar bursa becomes inflamed the median nerve gets compressed compressed between the ulnar bursa and the flexor retinaculum and this compression of the median nerve in the carpal tunnel is known as the carpal tunnel syndrome carpal tunnel syndrome clear now what passes through the split of the flexor retinaculum you can see this the flexor retinaculum splits here on the lateral side and what passes through the split of the flexor retinaculum there's a tendon which goes through this what is that <clears throat> what is the tendon which passes through the flexor retinaculum and this tendon is also enclosed in a synovial sheath here but the synovial sheath is not named here and this is the tendon of flexor carpi radialis flexor carpi radialis so normally we say that flexor carpi radialis goes outside the carpal tunnel it passes through through the flexor retinaculum okay flexor carpi radialis so these are the structures which are passing through the carpal tunnel they pass below the flexor retinaculum now what are the structures which go above the flexor retinaculum retinaculum just have a look like the flexor retinaculum divides on the lateral side the flexor retinaculum splits on the lateral side similarly the flexor retinaculum gives an extension on the medial side it gives a small extension on the medial side and this is what we call as the volar carpal ligament volar carpal ligament this extension of the flexor retinaculum on the medial side is known as the volar carpal ligament and this tunnel which is formed here is known as the gyons tunnel gyons tunnel okay this is the gyons tunnel and what will pass through the gyons tunnel is the ulnar artery and the ulnar nerve ulnar nerve and ulnar artery so ulnar nerve and ulnar artery they go above the flexor retinaculum they pass through the gyons tunnel so if you have to select out of ulnar nerve and artery and flexor carpi radialis which structure goes above the flexor retinaculum what would the best answer be the best answer is going to be the ulnar nerve and vessels because they definitely go outside but flexor carpi radialis passes through the carpal uh, through the flexor retinaculum okay you have to see the options uh, and answer accordingly the same the answer can change for the same question with different options hmm? okay now what is this structure what is this tendon which passes above the flexor retinaculum that's the tendon of palmaris longus tendon of palmaris longus which goes outside the above the flexor retinaculum then there's a nerve here there's a nerve here and there's an artery which passes from here <clears throat> artery right so what is this artery this is the superficial palmar branch of that's a superficial palmar branch of radial artery superficial palmar branch of radial artery <clears throat> what is this this is the palmar cutaneous branch of median nerve palmar cutaneous branch of median nerve and this is the palmar cutaneous branch of ulnar nerve palma cutaneous branch of median nerve and palma cutaneous branch of ulnar nerve tell me what is the palma cutaneous branch of median nerve supply yes anyone answer this what is the palma cutaneous branch of median nerve supply palma cutaneous branch of median nerve supplies the skin over thenar Emilin supplies the skin over thenar eminence. Very good. Thenar eminence. Very nice. Very nice. You know this. And what is the palmar cutaneous branch of ulnar nerve supply? The skin over hypothenar eminence. <coughs> skin over the hypothenar eminence. This is perfect. Clear to all of you. This is very important MCQ. Extremely important MCQ. So I've told you everything about the carpal tunnel, the flexor retinaculum, the structures which go above the flexor retinaculum, and the structure which go below the flexor retinaculum through the carpal tunnel. 
Perfect to all of you. I'll then proceed. <coughs> right. So what is the answer for this? Ek minute, the best answer for this would be the ulnar artery. Ulnar artery because ulnar artery definitely passes through the flexor ulnar artery. Huh? Ulnar artery. Flexor pollicis longus passes through the carpal tunnel enclosed in a synovial sheath. Name, name the radial bursa. Flexor carpi radialis passes through the flexor retinaculum. The medial nerve passes through the carpal tunnel between the ulnar bursa and the flexor retinaculum. <coughs> okay. See the next MCQ. Identify this blue pointed structure. Yes, Irshad, what happened? I didn't find the blue pointed structure. Come on, come on, come on. This you should know. This is very important. Very, very important. Yes, come on. Answer. Something you answer. Even if it is wrong, it's okay. <clears throat> blue pointed structure. You can see that clearly. Anyone? Anyone? Yes, Nitin. What is that? Ankit. Flexor digitorum profundus. Huh. Jiban. Right. That's a flexor digitorum profundus. And if I point a pointer here for you, what is this tendon of? What is this? Digital expansion. Digital expansion is on the dorsal aspect. Dorsal aspect. Dorsal digital expansion. The blue pointed structure is the tendon of flexor digitorum profundus. Flexor digitorum profundus. And what is this a red pointed structure? That's the flexor digitorum superficialis. Flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor digitorum profundus. I'll draw this slide for you. <clears throat> Understand this. Now, if I make this as the hand here, hmm. Tell me, what is the origin of flexor digitorum superficialis? Bol sakte flexor digitorum superficialis. Origin. Come on, come on, come on. Be interactive. Answer this. Origin of flexor digitorum superficialis. It's from the medial epicondyle. It's a superficial muscle. It arises from the medial epicondyle of the humerus. Now, the flexor digitorum superficialis has four tendons for four fingers and four tendons for four fingers. So, I'll just make this uh, as the flexor digitorum superficialis ka tendon. Okay, one moment. I'll just make this as the four tendons of flexor digitorum superficialis. Now, each tendon at the base of the proximal phalanx, at the base of the proximal phalanx, each tendon divides into two. Huh? <coughs> Yes, it, uh, it also arises from the anterior oblique line of radius. It arises from the medial epicondyle of the humerus. Very good. Very good. Uh, what's your name? Okay. I'm not able to get your name. But good, you're answering well. Karnati. Karnati. Yes. Uh, it arises from the medial epicondyle of the humerus. It also arises from the oblique line of the radius. The anterior oblique line oh, okay, of the radius. So, these are the four tendons of flexor digitorum superficialis. The four tendons of flexor digitorum superficialis. Now, each tendon at the base of the proximal phalanx. At the base of proximal phalanx, each tendon divides into two slips like this. It divides into two slips. And this is inserted on the base of the middle phalanx phalanx right these two slips are inserted on the base of the middle phalanx they are inserted on the base of middle phalanx look at this like this like this <coughs> like this so now you tell me this flexor digitorum superficialis is going to act on all the joints that it has crossed okay it will act on all the joints that it has crossed means it is crossing which joint elbow joint first you know? so it will cause flexion at the elbow joint second flexion at the wrist joint third flexion at the metacarpophalangeal joints and it will also cause flexion at the proximal interphalangeal joints proximal interphalangeal joints is the flexor digitum superficial is going to act on the distal interphalangeal joints is it going to act on the distal interphalangeal joints no 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 
it is not going to act on the distal interphalangeal joint because it arises, it doesn't cross the distal interphalangeal joint. It is inserted into the base of the middle phalanx, right? So this is the tendon of flexor digitorum superficialis inserted on either sides of the base of middle phalanx. And there's another tendon here, look at this, there's another tendon uh, which, uh, which passes through the superficialis. You've got another muscle that's the flexor digitorum profundus. The tendon of flexor digitorum profundus passes through the superficialis and is inserted into the base of distal phalanx. Okay, so these are inserted into the bases of distal phalanx. So now you tell me who's going to flex the distal interphalangeal joints who's going to flex the distal interphalangeal joints that's the flexor digitorum profundus right the profundus is going to flex the distal interphalangeal joints only the profundus so you get many clinical mcqs like a football player meets with an accident huh? he, he meets with an injury and he's not able to flex the distal interphalangeal joint of the fingers which is the tendon ruptured so your answer is going to be the flexor digitorum profundus flexor digitorum profundus quickly tell me what is the nerve supply of the flexor digitorum profundus it has got two half one is the medial half medial half and the other one is the lateral half medial half lateral half yes quickly answer what is the nerve supply of the lateral half of flexor digitorum profundus lateral half lateral half of flexor digitum profundus be specific be specific come on come on come on be specific so medial half i agree that's ulna nerve ulna nerve and the lateral half is the anterior interosseous nerve anterior interosseous nerve and this anterior interosseous nerve is a deep branch of medial nerve it's a deep branch of medial nerve given after it passes between the two heads of pronated teres right so anterior interosseous nerve is a deep branch of medial nerve given after it passes between the two heads of the pronated teres and what is the anterior interosseous nerve supply one it supplies the lateral half of flexor digitorum profundus okay lateral half of flexor digitorum profundus anything else anything else nerve supply uh, uh, the muscle supplied by anterior interosseous nerve we're discussing one is the lateral half of flexor digitorum profundus anything else the pronator quadratus very good pronator quadratus and the flexor pollicis longus excellent very good very good very good hmm? flexor pollicis longus the pronator quadratus and the lateral half of the profundus yes and who supplies the flexor digitorum superficialis flexor digitorum superficialis who supplies who's going to supply the flexor digitorum superficialis Hmm. Flexor digitorum superficialis is supplied by medial nerve, right? That is supplied by medial nerve. Very good. Very good, very good. So, clear to all of you, no? Yep. Right, right. So, the answer for this is profundus. Right, very good. Answer this. The next MCQ. Yes. Answer this. What is the answer? You can see this not properly. Okay. So answer is <clears throat> answer is D for this, right? Fine, fine. So answer is D for this. D D here answer is D. Answer is D for this. Why? Why I'll tell you why? Look here. A 33 years old male patient suffered, suffered from sudden occlusion at the beginning of descending thoracic aorta. I'll tell you, I'll tell you. Uh, sudden occlusion at the beginning of descending thoracic aorta, the condition would most likely re, uh, result in decreased blood flow in which of the falling intercostal arteries. So there's an occlusion in the descending thoracic aorta. This is clear. 
is an occlusion in the descending thoracic aorta. Now, what are the branches of the descending thoracic aorta? One moment. Huh? Now, um, hmm. So the descending thoracic aorta gives arteries behind in the intercostal spaces. This is what we call as the posterior intercostal arteries. Posterior intercostal arteries. So posterior intercostal arteries, look, <coughs> I'll just write this down. Posterior intercostal arteries. You've got anterior intercostal arteries as look and a rib, a rib starts from behind, starts from the vertebrae and comes in front towards the sternum. You clear it? So intercostal space would start from backside, from the uh, vertebral column and it will come in front towards the sternum. The spaces in front are known as what? Anterior intercostal spaces. The spaces in front would be known as anterior intercostal spaces and the spaces behind would be known as the posterior intercostal spaces. Okay? So the arteries in front would be known as what? The anterior intercostal arteries and the arteries behind would be known as the posterior intercostal arteries. Posterior intercostal arteries. Right. So the posterior intercostal arteries in the lower spaces, in the lower spaces are branches of what? In the lower spaces are branches of descending thoracic aorta. Descending thoracic aorta. So posterior intercostal arteries in the lower spaces are branches of descending thoracic aorta. So if there's an occlusion of the descending thoracic aorta, understanding? Ha, wait, 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 wait. Yes. If there's an occlusion of the descending thoracic aorta, which intercostal arteries will be affected? The lower intercostal arteries below the second intercostal space. Okay. In the uh, below the second, the first and the second is different. First and the second are not branches of descending thoracic aorta. I'll tell you. So in the lower spaces, these are branches of descending thoracic aorta. Clear? Now, one moment. I'll just clear this. In the lower spaces, these are branches of descending thoracic aorta. In the upper two spaces, in the upper two spaces, in the upper two spaces, hmm, these are branches of branches of superior intercostal artery. These are branches of superior intercostal artery, which is a branch of costo cervical trunk. Branch of costo cervical trunk, which is a branch of second part of subclavian artery. Second part of subclavian artery. Understanding this? So clear to all of you. So that is why if there's an occlusion of the descending thoracic aorta, which intercostal arteries would be affected? The lower intercostal arteries, not the first and the second. The first and the second intercostal arteries are branches of the superior intercostal artery, which is a branch of costal cervical trunk, which is a branch of second part of subclavian artery. Is this clear? Understood this? <coughs> Yes, tell me. Is this clear to all of you? Okay, uh, doubt is me. If there's any doubt, you let me know. Hmm? Look, that was the MCQ. So answer is lower six posterior intercostal arteries. It's basically the lower intercostal arteries below second, below second. Okay, very good. Very good, very good, very good. Come on to the next uh, slide. Identify the pointed structure. Identify this pointed structure. Anterior spaces bull. Okay, one moment. Anterior intercostal spaces. Just one moment. I'll finish that. Anterior intercostal spaces. Okay, okay, okay. Anterior intercostal arteries in the one one moment. Anterior intercostal arteries in the upper six spaces. Are branches of one moment in the upper six spaces are branches of internal thoracic artery 
in the lower spaces I'll tell you our branches of muscularphrenic artery clear yes miss nair clear so the anterior intercostal arteries in the in the upper six spaces are branches of internal thoracic artery in the lower spaces these are branches of musculophrenic artery fine we will see this something some in some other mcq sorry so what is this pointed structure what are you saying this is the soft palate soft palate here this is the soft palate it is not epiglottis epiglottis is this yeah they call this is epiglottis and this is epiglottis epiglottis is behind the tongue and you know this epiglottis is connected to the tongue by what the epiglottis is connected to the tongue by two folds two folds which are known as the glosso epiglottic folds glosso epiglottic folds one is a median glosso epiglottic fold and two lateral glosso epiglottic folds so median and two lateral glosso epiglottic folds and beach mein there's a depression in between what is that depression known as if you can answer this what is that depression known as? <clears throat> hmm. Answer this. So the tongue, uh, I, I can't draw it here for you. But they go, yeah, epiglottis hai, and this epiglottis is connected to the tongue by means of three folds like this. This is one in the center and these are two on the sides. Ha, very good. This is known as the median and lateral glosso epiglottic folds. And in between you get space here, a depression here, which is known as the valicula. Valicula. Ha, valicula. Whatever. That's valicular, right? So median and lateral glossy epiglottic folds, and the depression in between is the valicular. Fine, clear. Uh, I'll, I'll just come back to this. Before that, I'll brief you about our platform that we have. Okay, coming back to the slide, just two minutes. Huh? We have got a plus subscription in which we have got daily live classes, live quizzes, structured courses, and unlimited access to the course material. An iconic subscription where you've got the best of an academy, the lectures, and the pre platter notes. A limited time offer wherein the prices are further slashed down. Have a look at the website. Now, see, this is a new thing that we have started, scholarship test. And it's at, on July 10th. Yeah, 10th July at 8 p.m right and uh, there are rewards rewards here you've got a big chance to win so hundred percent scholarship on one year plus subscription you've got 75 percent scholarship on uh, six months 12 months 18 months and 24 months of subscription 50 percent scholarship and 25 percent scholarship okay for the for rank 5 to 9 and 10 to 19 just uh, just spread this word among your friends right so you've started with a scholarship test <coughs> Yeah. So three month subscription you get one month free and twelve month subscription you get two months free. We are we've started with a uh, four year subscription course for our foundation students. Raise a hand technique wherein you know if you raise the hand there's an icon you can directly talk to the educator. Right. A new batch which is starting from 14th of July, the Focus FMG batch. Okay, we're starting from 14th of July. Target next 22 and professional batch 2. Second year course, second year MBBS, we're starting from 14th of July, a new batch. We are also starting with clinical integrated batches uh, from 14th of July hmm, and a dual educator. So um, I also have got lectures with surgery, EMT faculties. Okay, so we'll be discussing the topics here. Download the Unacademy app. <clears throat> okay so here we are tell me now which are the muscles of the soft palate come on which are the muscles of soft palate one is the tensor palate levator palate tensor palate levator palate then palate of glasses palate of pharynges and the one which hangs in the center when you do an ah what's that musculus uli musculus uli so palate of glasses palate of pharynges the tensor palate, the levator palate, and the musculus uvulae. Tell me, what is the nerve supply of all these muscles? Answer this. What is the nerve supply of all these muscles? Nerve supply of the soft palate, in other words. <coughs> nerve supply of the soft palate is by pharyngeal plexus or the vago accessory complex. It is the pharyngeal plexus or the vago accessory complex, except 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 one muscle yes we had just discussed the first pharyngeal arch in the morning uh, at the beginning of the lecture who's that 
except one muscle that's a tensor palliative tensor palliative which is supplied by the mandibular nerve mandibular nerve through through the nerve to medial pterygoid mandibular nerve through the nerve to medial pterygoid right so all the muscles of the soft palate are supplied by the pharyngeal plexus except the tensor palliative which is supplied by the mandibular nerve through the nerve to medial pterygoid nerve to medial pterygoid Hmm. Palatoclosis is supplied by pharyngeal plexus. Pharyngeal plexus. See tensor palatii, levator palatii, palatoclosis, palatopharynges, and muscular zeolae. Palatoclosis is a muscle of tongue. Palatoclosis is a muscle of soft palate also. No. So all the muscles of the tongue are supplied by hypoglossal nerve except palatoclosis, which is supplied by pharyngeal plexus. Nithin, following no. Palatoclosis is supplied by pharyngeal plexus, even though it's a muscle of the tongue. So that is how we say all the muscles of the tongue are supplied by hypoglossal nerve except palatoclosis which is supplied by the pharyngeal plexus. Clear Nathan? <clears throat> okay. What is the nerve supply of epiglottis? Anyone? Nerve supply of epiglottis. Epiglottis is supplied by? Yes, yes, yes. Anyone? Anyone? Epiglottis. Nerve supply of epiglottis. This is the epiglottis. Here they go. That's the epiglottis. And this epiglottis is supplied by. No, no. I want a specific answer. Specific bolo. Internal laryngeal nerve. No, internal laryngeal. Epiglottis is derived from the fourth pharyngeal arch. Fourth pharyngeal arch, right? So the nerve of the fourth pharyngeal arch is superior laryngeal nerve. The superior laryngeal divides into an external and internal laryngeal. So nerve supply of epiglottis is the internal laryngeal nerve. Internal laryngeal. Nerve. Okay, I hope everything is clear to you. We'll meet again tomorrow at 9 o'clock with a mixed bag MCQ as well as the image based revision. Okay, thank you. Thank you to all of you. Thank you.